It would be what the city of Oklahoma City would have to at some point respond to in a major disaster. So we went there in, uh, in July prior to uh, 1995. It was interesting because they told us that 60% of the cities that come up there and do this training come, go back within a year and have to respond to, uh, to some kind of disaster. We said if you'd have told us that, we might not have come up here, you know. But uh, it was real interesting because a lot of the team players that would have responded to a natural disaster were already in place, already had built relationships with one another, uh, so that when the bombing happened, all that training that had happened prior to that in, uh, in July really kicked in and really gave us a, a step up on the situation, though we didn't know that we'd be responding to a man-made disaster. Uh, our chaplaincy program, we had trained for for several years uh, uh, clergy in our area to be police and fire chaplains. And in fact, uh, that year they were having the, the International Critical Incident Trust Foundation was having their World Congress. And uh, Chaplain Joe Williams and I had signed up to go and at the last minute decided, you know, we, we'd, we've had a lot of that training and we'd, we'll, we'll just stay home. Of course, we're glad we did because if we had been there, it would have been at the time the bombing took place. But we had done some prior training, so we were fortunate. Within uh, within an hour of the bombing, we had probably 15 trained fire and police chaplains who were on site to begin helping us uh, do ministry. Is there any Well, we learned that you manage chaos right off the bat because uh, it, it looked pretty chaotic, but it really was managed pretty well at the very beginning. Um, I don't know that you can ever prepare yourself for the uh, amount of carnage uh, that we were going to experience in that building. We had Vietnam veterans who told us in all of Vietnam they never saw the carnage there that they saw in the, in the Morrow building. I don't know that we could ever have prepared our site, ourselves for the sights and the sounds and the smells of what was going on in such a horrendous uh, explosion that took place in the heart of Oklahoma City. Um, when you counsel somebody in that kind of a situation, uh, I would think that uh, you uh, fall in a triage in a way. How do you identify them? Well, you know, when we first responded, uh, we just started uh, trying to set up an area of looking at where the greatest needs might be because, again, uh, the, um, the chaos that was going on, as we, as we brought chaplains down uh, to sign up and to make sure we knew who, who was there, uh, we first of all began to just uh, put them out in some of the areas, triage areas that they were setting up, only to find out that most of those triage areas didn't treat anybody because most of the people that were injured in the Murrow building either walked out of the building, were either taken out very early, put in ambulances and taken to the local hospitals, so that by the time the triage areas got set up around the, the Murrow building itself, there, there was nobody to treat because those people had already been transported to local hospitals and uh, that were alive. And we didn't take, we took the last live body out of that building with an amputation on the, on the first day and that was the last live body taken out of the building. So there was some disappointment on the part of some of the medical people who came and set up triage areas expecting to treat people at the scene and had nobody to treat because those people had already been transported either by private vehicles or by ambulances to local hospitals which were in the immediate uh, area of the Murrow building. Uh, right, a lot. Uh, of course our police and fire chaplains began to just kind of be there to kind of monitor and see what was going on with the rescue community and our rescue people that were there. And they were pretty busy, so a lot of good counseling that you thought might go on early didn't go on because uh, the early part of what we did was simply to support them, to be there to listen to them, to carry water to them, to, um, uh, to just be a ministry of presence 
a lot of great ministry took place after we realized it was going to become not a re, not a rescue but a recovery operation. Uh, a lot of that took place in areas where where the where they pulled off the side and came in to get a cup of coffee or to get a sandwich, and we'd just put a chaplain there to sit down and just visit with with them and uh, introduce ourselves and and let them uh, do the talking. Now. That was a different ministry to the Family Assistance Center. That was a whole different area. Uh, that area was set up uh, uh, over at the First Christian Church, and we did have a lot of local pastors who responded to the First Christian Church to deal with the family members. So we had, we had ministry going on at the Family Assistance Center with, uh, with local clergy, and the ministry going on at the site was primarily with those who were there to do recovery work. 